Jonathan returns, and he has a license to kill. We open with Buffy fighting vampires while everyone else is just kind of standing around. And surprisingly, when one of them gets away, they actually chase after it. But it turns out because we're in an alternate universe, that's why she did it. <laughs> <laughs> and they follow it into a mausoleum where a bunch of vampires are eating someone. Buffy is unusually cognizant of her situation and says there are too many to handle and they need help. So they go to a big mansion, say they need help, and there's a big reveal. When the chair turns around and it turns out the person they're talking to is Jonathan, the guy who hasn't shown up in a while and at one point was picking people off from that clock tower, right? When he had a view to a kill. Well, he was going to kill himself. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but Buffy convinced him to die another day. It's not like the sky was falling. This was no time to die. <laughs> and if he did die, he might come back as a specter. What? <laughs> Then we get the intro to this episode, which is filled with shots of Jonathan looking cooler than I could ever hope to. <laughs> <laughs> They're at Giles' house, and Jonathan seems to be the brains and the lead of the gang, giving them all directives, and they're all pretty much fawning over him. And Willow is actually doing some hacking again, which we haven't seen in a while, and she even uses some exaggerated sound effects to find a plan of the cemetery. Sometimes there's a... Oh, no back way in. I would have thought by this point she would have combined her hacking skills with her magic skills and somehow used magic to hack stuff. Didn't she do that at one point? Oh, she I think it was uh, she said she could use that to get into the initiative uh, files or something. Well, she should keep doing that because I want to see how that works. Yeah, I agree. They head back to the cemetery, and luckily when they get there, the vampires haven't completely drained the body given that a good amount of time has passed. While the others come in through doorways, Jonathan enters through the skylights that for some reason exists in this mausoleum and starts <laughs> shooting with a crossbow. And during the battle, Buffy pulls a Buffy and lets a vampire get away. But since Jonathan is there, he actually manages to shoot him down. And Buffy apologizes for being Buffy, but Jonathan says no big deal. And after they're done, a bunch of reporters take pictures and scramble for interviews while the gang relays what happened. And after the paparazzi leave, Jonathan says that vampires... They mostly like to hang out all creepy and alone in the shadows. And I was afraid that meant that Angel was going to pop out, but thankfully it turns out he's referring to Spike, who he spotted in the shadows with his golden eye. <laughs> Spike and Buffy throw some insults at each other, but Jonathan ends things by telling Spike that he'd better watch out or he's going to end up looking like... Instant soup mix. We cut to Willow and Tara who are talking about past episodes, and while they're doing this, it's revealed they're creating a giant collage of Jonathan. In Riley's room, Buffy asks if he's recovered from his injuries, and we see that he has a signed Jonathan basketball poster on his door. It replaced his awesome balls poster. Too bad, that one was way cooler. But I did notice it was missing the Thunderball. <laughs> Riley wonders what'll happen to him now that he's not taking the initiative supplements. And I thought it was really funny that he said, I don't know if I'll get smarter, which I didn't think would happen. But he also said, I don't know if I'll get dumber, which I didn't think could happen. But <laughs> who knows? And when he tries to get close to Buffy, she is clearly very uncomfortable and ends up leaving. The next day, she talks to Jonathan about her and Riley and her recent experiences with Faith. While she fixes coffee, which turns out not to be for her, but for him, which I thought was funny. And while Jonathan talks about how Buffy's really mad at Riley and not Faith for not recognizing that it wasn't really Buffy before, girls keep coming over for autographs, including one named... It's Karen with a K. <laughs> Jonathan tells her they can get past their problems if they talk it through, and he says... If you really want it, you can make anything happen. We cut to the initiative, where a new dude is apparently in charge named Colonel Haviland, and he says their mission has not changed, even though Walsh is gone but he yields control to Jonathan, who he calls their tactical consultant. Jonathan points out that Adam doesn't eat and thinks he runs on a piece of uranium, which will power him indefinitely. And he says that means that cutting off his head will not kill him, which is a conclusion that I fail to see the logic in. Yeah. And he says they need to annihilate him completely. So why not just use a rocket launcher like they did on the judge? Who was also supposedly indestructible. Or maybe send in a man with a golden gun. No, that's not good. Uh, Why don't they send him to the moon, Raker? <laughs> <laughs> and when Jonathan said he'll last essentially forever, I wondered if maybe it wasn't uranium but a diamond, because diamonds are forever. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we're going to get so many subscribers from this video. <laughs> 
All those James Bond fans are going to be piling in. All the way from Russia with love. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Karen with a K is spying for Jonathan and his mansion, but she's attacked by a demon. But she pretty easily manages to get away. Because you only live twice. Does that even make sense there? No. <laughs> Jonathan tells Riley that Buffy wants to forgive him, but is afraid of talking to him about things. But Jonathan tells Riley to stop being such an octopussy. <laughs> Riley says Buffy has to know that she's the one he really cares about. But Jonathan says, People can't always see what's right in front of them. We cut to the bronze, where there is a much better musical performance than usual happening, with a band that appeared in the hit film, The Mask. Anya is infatuated with Jonathan, much to Xander's chagrin, and Anya just wants Xander to be the spy who loved me. <laughs> this is a... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jonathan suddenly takes the stage and dedicates a song to Buffy and Riley, who get up to dance together. And they make up. Drama resolved. So maybe this alternate universe isn't that bad. And the episode's not even half over. Let's just cut off the entire series right here. Jonathan suddenly busts out a trumpet, and Xander and Anya go off to bang. Karen with a K suddenly runs in, and Jonathan stops to see what's wrong. Back at his mansion, she says she was attacked and relays what happened, and ends up drawing a symbol that she saw on the monster's forehead, which throws Jonathan off. But Jonathan says that's not for your eyes only, takes it away from her, and tries to brush it off saying it's a monster that usually stays away from populated areas and shouldn't be a problem. Buffy protests, but he says he can handle it. Elsewhere, Adam is watching TVs, plural, and talking to one of his vampire flunkies, who is really annoying. The flunky points out Jonathan, saying how cool he is, but Adam says it's all lies, and Jonathan must have cast a spell. He says it doesn't affect him because he is in tune with every molecule of his being and everything around him. So I guess that's one of his powers, in addition to reading multiple floppy disks at the same time. And being able to watch multiple TV shows at the same time. And he also says he doesn't need to do anything about it because the magics are corrosive, whatever the hell that means. He says it will lead to chaos, which interests him. Back in his mansion, Jonathan is enjoying a quantum of solace when a pair of twins ask him to come back to bed, and we see that he has the mark from the monster on his shoulder. Buffy is walking with Willow and Tara, saying that Jonathan told her they don't need to track and hunt the monster that Karen with a K saw earlier, but she was surprised that Jonathan appeared scared, which Willow finds ridiculous. Tara goes off toward her dorm on her own and gets attacked by the monster from earlier. She manages to cast a spell to make a small, ineffectual amount of smoke and barely manages to get away. The next day, Willow finds her and brings her back to her room, and when Buffy comes in, Tara is able to describe the same symbol that Karen with a K saw. So Buffy goes to Xander's, who is not home, and Anya tries to pretend she's not annoyed that Buffy wants to look at some of his stuff. Xander has a bunch of Jonathan comics, Jonathan sports cards, Jonathan posters, etc. And Buffy points out how strange it is that Jonathan is so good at everything. Buffy speculates about alternate realities and magic and how Anya used to do that kind of stuff. And Anya says it is possible, but she's so distracted by her infatuation with Jonathan, just dreaming that he'll use his gold finger on her. <laughs> <laughs> Buffy goes to the others to talk to them about her questions, and they talk about some of the great things that Jonathan has done, like blowing up the mayor and starring in The Matrix. But Buffy says they might not be able to trust their memories that all those things really happened. The rest of the gang dismisses her, including Riley, which upsets her, but then he remembers what his character arc is supposed to be in this episode, and he says they should back her up. Buffy points out the mysterious mark and the monster, and asks if Giles has the Jonathan swimsuit calendar, which he initially denies, but then admits that he does. They flip through it until Buffy finds a picture showing the same mark on Jonathan's shoulder, and Jonathan suddenly shows up, making Buffy very nervous. He explains that Buffy is correct, and he does have a history with the monster, but he says the mark is a reminder, because every time he encounters the monster, it clouds his memory. Everyone immediately accepts his explanation except for Buffy. She suggests going after the monster, insisting even when Jonathan says it's probably gone by now. They end up at the cemetery, where they run into Spike and grill him for information, but all they can do is really shove him up against the wall, because it's nighttime, which is good. Because otherwise they could just throw him out into the living daylights. And he finally admits that something kicks some vampires out of a cave in a park. Back at Giles' house, the gang is researching magic. Riley asks Anya about being a vengeance demon, and I wonder if this is the first time that he found out about that. Because I would have thought he'd have asked those questions, you know, episodes ago. Yeah. 
They find out from the mark that Jonathan did a spell that turned him into the ideal version of everything. And Giles says that in order to balance the good, the spell creates a force of evil, which is the monster, and if it dies, it should erase the spell. And Anya points out that Jonathan wouldn't want that to happen. In the cave, Buffy and Jonathan find a deep hole in the ground, and they very smartly stand right on the edge. And Jonathan reaches for her when she's not looking, and I really wondered if he was going to try to push her in, but he just pulls her away. What a good misdirect. They're suddenly attacked by the monster, and as Buffy fights more and more, she starts to regain her ability to kick ass. And I liked how Jonathan tore a stalactite off the ceiling to help fight it. And Jonathan eventually runs and tackles the monster, who falls into the yawning chasm with Jonathan, but Buffy grabs Jonathan before he falls, and the monster plummets to his doom, screaming, Dr. No! <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that one in there somehow. Yeah. <laughs> The spell reverses and everything goes back to normal. Later, the gang discusses things, right in the middle of campus as usual, and they see Jonathan standing off on the side. And their dialogue while Buffy goes to talk to him was pretty funny. And who really did star in the Matrix? Jonathan says that people are mostly forgetting the effects of the spell, which I'm glad they mentioned. But it brought up some questions of how many people would remember, and the fact that everyone remembers initially is kind of a big deal. Yeah, I assume that the main characters will remember later just because they're the main characters. I mean, you know, if it ever comes up again. Right. And he says no one is talking to him and that the twins moved out. So would they feel like they had been, you know, violated? I think that's a deeper question than they were hoping to bring up. Buffy asks Jonathan how he did it. And he says when he went to counseling after his suicide attempt, he met a kid who knew all about the spell, but he didn't mention the monster. So how did Jonathan know that hurting the monster would weaken the spell if he didn't know about the monster to begin with. And how many other people know about this spell? Are people casting world-altering spells all the time? Yeah, there should be alternate realities conflicting with each other constantly. Wouldn't that risk rupturing subspace? Buffy tells Jonathan there's no way a magic spell can solve problems that need to be solved on their own. And even though Jonathan had everything, apparently the world was not enough. But she tells him not to give up, because tomorrow never dies, and if he keeps working at things, they can get better. Jonathan says that sounds like what he told her about her and Riley, and that she should keep working on it because their relationship is worth it. And then he leaves. Buffy makes up with Riley by making out with Riley. And everything appears to be fine, and at the last second, Buffy calls out, Casino Royale. <laughs> <laughs> Superstar. Overall, this was an interesting idea, and the fact that it kind of popped out of nowhere was equally as interesting. But again, it was an episode completely ignoring the fact that Adam, the biggest threat they face so far, is still there. So I guess it's good that he's just sitting watching TV all the time. His explanation for knowing that Jonathan cast a spell didn't really explain anything, and his further explanation about why he wasn't getting involved was equally dumb. I know we've mentioned that Adam should show up more because he's around, but it also has to be in the right way. Just having him show up to be like, yo, what's up, I'm Adam, and then disappear isn't the same thing. It almost makes it worse. How far did Jonathan's influence spread? Was it the entire world? It seems like yes, because they're talking about things that people outside of Sunnydale would have seen, like the Matrix. So even if people were starting to forget when things went back to normal, that means that some people were still remembering after the fact. So why wouldn't they write things down or make recordings and go after Jonathan to figure out how he did that? And if it was the entire world, that means that people would be after him from the entire world. And maybe not even humans, maybe even demons and crap. That's a good point. And can anybody perform any spell just like that by reading some words? I mean, we even saw Xander set a book on fire by saying two words out loud. If that's the case, then is Willow just really, really, really bad if all it takes <laughs> is just to read these six words? Does she, is she just mispronouncing all of the words? Is she saying them in the wrong order? Is she using some derivative of Latin? What's going on, Willow? And I said it before, but if it's that easy to do a spell so massive, why aren't there tons of alternate realities all happening at the same time? And does it create an alternate reality, or does it just alter the existing reality? 
which, you know, it's not going to get answered, but I want to know. This goofy throwaway idea inadvertently created a ton of questions. I did appreciate the amount of Jonathan merchandise and how much effort the producers went through to put props everywhere. I thought it was pretty effective and pretty amusing. And for a character that hasn't popped up in a long time and really has no lasting effect on the main story of the show, this was a weird episode. It's tough to grade this one because it wasn't bad, but it didn't fit. So I guess I'll just place it somewhere in the middle. I'll give it a C plus. Okay, I gave it a B plus. You do have some good points. This episode was very focused on the humor, and I thought the humor worked really well, even with Xander in this episode. The whole episode reminded me of the Zeppo, where you're focusing on kind of a side character that usually people don't care about so much, and it really kind of looks at all the other characters through a different lens. Right, but I would argue at that point, it fit better into the overall episodes around it. Yeah, that's definitely true. We just had a two-parter not dealing with Adam at all, and he only showed up for one completely inconsequential scene in this episode. So they're really plotting out this season really well. I liked that they brought back Jonathan because it has been about a full season since he showed up. And it's cool to see that level of continuity. And I wonder if he's even going to show up later because we still have three seasons left. Your questions about magic, I think for me, bring up something that I don't like about the show right now, which is they are doing a lot more stuff with magic and it does keep raising all these questions. I think what they should have done is make it not so easy for just anybody to do anything with magic. I mean, we've seen that the stuff that Willow does doesn't always work the way she wants it to, but it still works. It still has effects on the world. And if all you need is a book with the sentences in them, just do it. If everybody else knows that Willow is messing with magic like that, and that it is as powerful as it is, I would think all of them would be studying magic and saying, hey, if we all work together, we can probably fix everything. Right. Speaking of all of that, the gang seems very comfortable with Tara now. Did I miss something where she was introduced to the group? No, she's just kind of there now. I had questions about that too. Willow's been hiding her for so long, and there didn't end up being any reason for that. Are they just going to use the excuse of, well, it was the alternate universe, so she just happened to be there? I don't know. Maybe they'll bring that up later and say, hey, we actually know each other now. Because the only person she was really introduced to was fake Buffy when it was actually fake. Yeah. And then at the end of this episode, we just saw her hanging out with everybody else, including Riley. Which, I mean, it doesn't really feel like he usually hangs out with the group either. Right. This episode as a whole was just kind of a weird mix of things. For me, the best part was Buffy's interactions with Anya. We haven't really seen them interact very much before, and even if Anya's reactions to things don't make sense and are completely inconsistent with how she was portrayed at first, where she was able to pass herself off as a normal person, it's still funny, so I don't really mind it that much. Um, it's kind of like how Spike has evolved from something completely different from what he was at first, and that doesn't really make sense either, but it's funny. I agree that sticking this episode in so late in this season was extremely questionable. I feel like this could have worked better earlier in the season, and it probably would have been better if they didn't have to deal with the Adam stuff in the background, because that just kind of got in the way of everything else. And aren't we closing in on the end of this season? Is Adam just going to show up for the last two episodes? I don't know. That whole main season arc has really fallen apart, I feel like. Adam still doesn't feel like a big threat. The initiative guys don't feel like they matter much anymore either. Riley's not even really with them anymore. So, I don't know. I really wonder what they're going to do, but I doubt it's going to be all that interesting. This season has felt like it was slipping backward for a few episodes in terms of quality. And for me, this one put it back on track. But it was just one episode that really was a standalone episode. So I worry that the very next episode is going to be back to the kind of not great stuff that we've had with Adam lately. I just hope it doesn't turn out that we never get an episode like this again. Never say never again. <laughs>